Well, it's been um, some time since we, we've uh, been here, so I, I do want to review a little bit where we've come so far. So I'm just going to look at the table of contents. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to be looking at chapter 6 of the Westminster Confession. So chapter 1, we, we looked and discussed the, uh, the Holy Scriptures. If you remember, um, one of the things that the Westminster Divines had to do, had to figure out, is where to begin. And so uh, in true Reformed fashion, they begin with Scripture. Uh, and so once chapter 1 sort of established the, um, the right understanding of Scripture, they moved to chapter 2, which is discussing uh, God's, uh, God and the Holy Trinity, so specifically the attributes of God, who God is. And once, now that we, we know what the Bible is and, and we, we know ideally what it says, so what is it telling us about, the, about God? Because that's, that's the next most important thing to understand if we're going to be talking about theology, which is the study of God. Uh, who is this God that we, um, that we worship, that we study, that we, um, that we serve? And that moved uh, them to chapter 3, which is on God's eternal decree. So now that we know where to find information about God, and, and now that we know uh, roughly who God is in, in his character and his identity, what is it that he wants? What is his will? What is it that he does? And so uh, chapter 3 talked about uh, God's decree, uh, and we spent a long time talking about uh, election because that was one of the, the main ways that God makes his will come about. Um, and that led the Westminster Divines to chapter 4, which was on creation. Uh, and so, you know, if this God who decrees things, well, what is it that he decrees? One of the very first things that he decreed was creation. Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He said, let there be light. He said all these things. So decrees so that's why they start with creation after we, after talking about God's decrees, they move to creation because that, that is in scripture chronologically the first decree that, uh, that, is, that is mentioned. Uh, and then it moves to providence. Uh, we needed to understand God's providence in things, especially in creation, because after creation comes everything else. And everything else includes and is uh, overshadowed by the fall. And so in order to understand uh, the fall and God's plan of redemption, we need to first understand providence. So that's why we got to chapter 5, and that was where we left with, was with chapter 5 on God's providence. And so today, we're going to start chapter 6, which is of the fall of man, of sin, and of the punishment thereof. But before I dive in, are there any questions um, before we, we get started? All right. Well, seeing none, I'll uh, start by reading the first article here. So article one says, our first parents being seduced by the subtlety and temptation of Satan sinned in eating the forbidden fruit. This, their sin, God was pleased according to his wise and holy counsel to permit, having purposed to order it to his own glory. So there's a, a, a lot in this first um, article here. Uh, and when we're looking at the fall and we're talking about the fall, we're talking about sin, we, we recognize that there's a reality in this world, that this world is not all right, that this world is not perfect. There's something wrong in this world. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are, uh, whether you're a Christian or not, uh, whether you believe in, in, in gods or not, the, you can look around the world and see that there's just something not perfectly right. There's something wrong. People uh, do things that are bad. Um, and so why, why is that? Um, and for Christian especially, we don't have to look far for the evidence of the fall. Uh, we, we can see that uh, people are capable of, of such great horrors that... Uh, each and every one of us is susceptible to uh, pain, to illness, to, to death. Um, these, are, these are things that we can just see and experience ourselves uh, to know that there's just something wrong, that there's something fallen with the world. 
Um, and if for some reason you live in a bubble and you've never experienced calamity and you've never been offended by someone, just look at nature. And you can see how nature is red in tooth and claw, um, that, that these creatures have to kill one another in order to survive, in order to, to live. There's something wrong with that. There's something that doesn't seem right about that. Um, Paul even lamented this in Romans chapter uh, 7, uh, starting in verse 14. I'll just read to you. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. And now Paul is going to go on this sort of, uh, uh, what almost sounds like a confusing rant, but he's, he's showing for us that the effects of the fall. Verse 16, but if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me. So he wills. The desire is there to do good. But the doing of the good is not. So the activity of good is not. For the good that I want to do, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am going to do the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. And he goes on and, and, and just talks about how the, the, the sin, and he even culminates in verse 24, the wretched man that I am. Uh, you know, he recognizes that, that he is, is also uh, full of, of sin or had, the effects of sin are present also in his life. Uh, so the good things that we want to do, we, we don't do them. And the bad things that we don't want to do, we, we do them. Um, and that's sort of the, the, the simplest form of seeing the fall, is that we, we want to do good things, but we don't always do them. And then we don't want to do bad things, but we do them anyways. And so sin, we see very quickly, sin is not a foreign problem. It's not something that happens to them out there. It's not, happen, it's not what other people do. Rather, it's internal and it's a personal struggle. Uh, and, and we have to always remember that, that we, each and every one of us, is struggling with, with sin uh, in our own lives. Um, this is so much, I guess, has been seen by so many people. And, and again, you don't have to be a Christian to see this because French philosopher Blaise Pascal, he noted that, that humanity is a supreme paradox. Okay, that's, that, that was his phrase. He said, at the same time, we are both creatures of the highest grandeur, recognizing just how, how blessed and how uh, well off the human race is as a, as a creature, as highest grandeur and the worst misery. He says that we can reflect on our existence like no other creature can. Okay? More likely, not, you know, your, your dog and your cat is not reflecting on their life, on their existence. The goldfish is likely not reflecting on his existence spinning around in that, uh, in that little bowl. We can do that. We can reflect on our existence. And this is what I mean. We can contemplate a better life, right? We can imagine a life without disease. We can imagine a life of comfort. We can imagine a life with, uh, with more money. We can imagine a life without death and without sorrow, and without pain. We can imagine those things. Uh, we, we, can, we can think about what, those, what a life like that is. But here's the paradox. Though we are able to think about and contemplate a better life, we are unable to achieve that same existence. Uh, no matter how hard we try, no matter how, how hard we, we try to rid ourselves of, of things that are bad, no matter how many diets we go on, no matter uh, how many uh, budgets we put out there, there's always going to be something wrong or something better or something can be improved. Um, and, and so we, we notice that that's, that's the paradox. That's what Blaise Pascal was getting at, is that we, we have this blessed state where we can devise and, and imagine a better world, but we have a hard time making that better world come to fruition. And so secularists, they see the human race, these are folks who are not Christians, folks who are not believers, they see the human race as marching shortly upward, 
uh, progressing beyond previous generations. And, and we see that in, in like archaeology and things like that, where uh, you talk about how we are today in the 21st century so much smarter than, uh, the, than our ancestors and our ancients. We're able to build these uh, beautiful skyscrapers and things like that. And, uh, and, and we have technology and science and medication that are, are extending life uh, much better than, than the conditions from before. But if you look across history and you look across the world, we actually, or at least the secularist, has to wrestle with that optimism. Um, he, he's, he, if he looks across the world and he sees, just even looking at history, if, if we're so far progressed in our technology, how in the world did the ancients build the pyramids? Well, it was aliens. That's what some people say. It was not aliens. You know, how, how are the ancients who, who, who were dumb and, and didn't have, you know, modern technology, how could they have built such grand structures? Well, you know, the secularist has to wrestle with that. And, and the Christian, the Bible shows that, that man is, is devolving, has been devolving from paradise to perdition, from the garden to the grave, from peace to pain. And that's, that's the movement that you see going on in Genesis, and that happens very quickly. You start with Genesis 3, with the fall, in Genesis 4, you get the first murder. And so you see how very quickly there's this, um, this de-evolution de de of the human race in a way. And so indeed, when we think of our first parents, we almost think of them as superhuman. That's one thing that when we think about Adam and Eve, at least I can remember when I was growing up, Adam and Eve were always like these Oh, they must have been like demigods or something like that, you know, or like, like you know, if you've ever studied Greek mythology, uh, people like Hercules and stuff like that, you know, these, these must have been like uh, really, really powerful folks who, who were much stronger than we are. Um, and somehow they were enjoying life free from the ravages of sin, and somehow they were free from the destruction, the deterioration that we all experience. Um, and, and so when we think about Adam and Eve, uh, which is what we're going to talk about in, in this section. We, we, we are laying for, for us the foundation of this chapter, which is, which is sin and its, and its reproduction, uh, repercussions. Excuse me. Uh, do you have a question? I'm a little puzzled by using the word God or thief. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> so um, we've we got to start with, with the fall itself first. Uh, so Genesis chapter 3 records the fall, and this is the origin of sin. This is why I would have titled this article. So in Genesis chapter 3, we see uh, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And it goes on and on. But this, is, I just want to stop at that one sentence because that's actually a jarring sentence when we think about it. If you're going through and reading and studying your Bible, we, you know, we get Genesis chapters 1 and 2, which is the creation of the world. You get all these beautiful imagery and um, and, and God creating uh, Adam and, and out of the dust of the earth and breathing life into him and, 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 and creating woman out of his, um, out of his uh, rib and all these you know, beautiful things. Then we get to chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast. That's a surprising sentence, isn't it? It's a jarring sentence. It sort of comes out of nowhere. Um, it, when, I, when I'm reading this, I think of um, when, you, when you read those very or watch those Really, really cheesy movies, especially those old school horror movies. And like the narrator says, it was a dark and stormy night. You know, that's, that's how I, I imagine chapter three starting. Uh, this is, you know, it's a dark and stormy night. Something is, is amiss. Something's not right. You know, the serpent, it was more crafty. And so suddenly and explicably, this, this ominous and foreboding note is introduced uh, in the scriptures. Uh, but that's exactly what happens. You know, it, it is a foreboding and an ominous thing. Uh, between Genesis chapter 4 and Revel Revelation chapter 22, all of that is God's response to and remedy for the fall. So that's, that's what the Bible is about. Uh, and so we, we get here in chapter uh, verse 1. So this serpent says to woman, Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. See, what happened here in this instant the serpent planted a seed of doubt in Eve's, in Eve's mind. Okay, remember, remember God's command. This was in chapter 2 of Genesis. Uh, God said, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if on that day you eat of it, you will surely die. And so the, the, initially, the temptation here is, is that indeed has God said. 
That was, that was the serpent's temptation there. Did God really say? Did he actually tell you that? And, and what this is, is, it's not just any doubt in general. This is a doubt in the integrity and the goodness of God. You know, if, if, the, if the serpent was able to, to plant in Eve's mind that mm, maybe, maybe God doesn't actually have my best interest in heart. Maybe God doesn't actually uh, care or love me. You know, that's the doubt that he's inserting in her mind. Uh, and, and he's claiming, you know, the, the, the serpent here is claiming that God's restrictions were somehow unjust or unfair or tyrannical. You know, in, in a way, you could also hear Satan saying, oh, do you think, why would, why would God do that? Why would, why, if this God loves you, why would he tell you you can't eat of that tree? That sounds, that sounds mean. That sounds unfair. That sounds like, a, sounds tyrannical. And so that's the, the seed that's initially planted into Eve's mind. John Paul Sartre, have you ever heard of that? Sartre, Sartre, I think that's like Sartre. He's French, Sartre. Uh, he was a French philosopher. Um, you might not know who he is, or, but you, you probably have, you know his philosophy, even if you don't know you know it. The philosophy is existentialism, and, and that has actually pervaded much of 21st century uh, thought. Uh, Sartre argued that humans can be completely and morally free, so we can only have true freedom if and when we are totally autonomous. So that was Sartre's idea and Sartre's notion was that we, the only true full liberty is autonomy. And of course that word autonomy is, comes from the Greek of self, auto, and nomos, meaning law. So essentially autonomy or autonomous means to be a law onto yourself, unto itself, something that is a law unto itself, uh, meaning that something that is autonomous is accountable to no one, is accountable to nothing. If, if this cup is a law unto itself, then it is held accountable to no other cup. This is the only definition of cup, and this can't be a definition of a cup. So if this were to decide, oh, it is a definition of a cup, it would have to be autonomous of cups, and so they can't do it. We Human beings love autonomy. We want to be able to say, oh, I'm not bound by any rules. I'm not bound by any constraints. I can do what I want, when I want, how I want to do it. And Sartre was one of the big philosophers who pushed for this. Uh, he, he argued that rules and regulations remove freedoms. Now, when have we heard that? Rules and regulations remove freedoms. He believed that anything, anything less than absolute autonomy, anything less than absolute autonomy is merely the illusion of freedom. So if you are not, if human beings are not completely autonomous, even though they might say they are free, that freedom is just an illusion in Sartre's mind. And so Sartre argues that if we answer to anyone then we are not truly free. Now you can see how Sartre's philosophy has permeated, even if you don't know who Sartre is or his existentialism, we can see how that is in every single aspect of our society today, isn't it? Right? Doesn't matter, you don't have to go far. You don't have to go to DC. You can just step out onto these streets. Perhaps you can even look into your own heart. We don't need to go far to see how this, this philosophy has, has inter, intersected our lives. And so the serpent tempted Eve like this. This is what he was saying to her. God might as well have said to you that you eat from none of these trees because he's binding you. He doesn't care about you. He's not giving you freedom. By restricting you in this one instance, he's taken away all of your freedom is essentially what the serpent says. Now, Eve shows she does understand God's command. We have to give her some credit. She doesn't immediately fall for that temptation. You know, everyone blames her, and to some extent it is her fault 
But she, she stood firm for a moment. Here in verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. We can eat. Look, we can eat from all these other plants. God said that we can do that. God hasn't restricted us, and we're allowed to eat from any of these trees. Verse 3, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden... You know, she even understood the sanctions of disobedience. This tree, that one, is the one that God said we can't eat. And if we do eat it, verse 3, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch or you will die. So she recognized that that temptation was false. What, what the serpent was telling her was incorrect. No, God didn't say that. God said we can eat of all these other trees. We just can't eat or touch that one. And that was it. But the serpent challenges her understanding. Verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. So first he starts by attacking God's character. Oh, that, that guy, he, you can't trust him. He doesn't want your, he doesn't care about you. He doesn't have your best interest in heart. But when, he, when she says, oh, he said we can do all these other things. We're, we're free to eat of all these other trees. That's just the one we're not at. Well, the devil twists and says, oh, well, if he can't attack God, he's going to attack the, the command. Oh, well, you're not going to die. He, the punishment, no, no, no. He's not going to do that to you. In, in that moment, he boldly lies and tempts her once again with autonomy. Verse 5, for God knows. So it's not, he, he's, he's again lying here. God's not going to kill you. No, no, no. He knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open. And guess what? And this is, this, is, this is what got her. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Mm. Now that is an enticing fruit. Who here doesn't want to know what God knows? She saw that. And maybe that light, that dark light, flicked in her head. Oh, I can know what God knows. I can think like God thinks. And so quite simply, the question boiled down to this. Will you obey God or will you do what is right in your own eyes? Dr. Sproul, whose book we're, we're using, he says, doing what you want to do rather than what God requires you to do is sin. That's the basic definition of sin. Doing what you want to do rather than doing what God requires of you. Our desires, our natural desires, are in conflict with God's law, and that's the problem. Our desires are in conflict. If our desires were aligned with God's law, there wouldn't be any sin. If we were naturally aligned with God's will, there would be no suffering and pain. Thankfully for us, the temptation of Adam and Eve has similar parallels in Satan's temptation of Jesus. This is important to note. Both our parents, our ancient parents, and our Savior had a period of trial, had a trial period or a, uh, a probationary period, if you will. Adam and Eve were on probation when exposed to the test. God gave them this command, and he let them go out there and see if they would follow. Jesus, too, was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be exposed to a probationary period of testing. Right after his baptism, he's sent out into the wilderness. Both, both of these settings revealed the, the state of the world at the time. Adam and Eve are, are in an immaculate garden. They're satisfied in all their needs and, and they're supporting one another. Jesus, he's in the wilderness. He's all alone. He's, he's hungry. He is separated from the world, just like the world is now separated from God. And both of them are tempted in their understanding of God. Adam and Eve were tempted. Did God actually say? Jesus, too, was tempted. After God declared, this is my beloved son, so that's the baptism, Matthew 3, 17, 
And then in Luke 4, 4, 3, when he's in the wilderness, the devil says, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. If you are the son of God. The devil was tempting Jesus in his understanding of what God declared. And where the first Adam failed, the second Adam succeeded. So what led to the fall was repeated, was repeated in order to lead to redemption. And this is why it pleased God that that should happen. Because God had in his mind the whole plan of redemption, the whole arc of redemption. What had been pre-planned, the first covenant set forth between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That was in his mind. And it pleased God that the fall should happen so that Jesus would pass the test. And so Satan's goal is to attack God's word God, he attacks God's word as authoritative, as, as truthful, and as good. He tempted both Adam and Jesus by twisting God's words. And today we see that the Bible's authority as the word of God continues to be assailed by Satan and his minions. It continues to be assaulted by false prophets. Indeed, this has been the, the historic um, rift within the church. Whenever false prophets arise, what are they doing? Throughout church history, we see that they are trying to diminish the authority and the truth and the goodness of God's word. Too many Christians today question the word of God. Why should this text dictate my life? That thing was written thousands of years ago. What weight does it have? What relevance does it have? Does it have? They read the text and they say, how can God say such things? How, how can God find these things pleasing? And they read the commands and they read the instructions and they say, do we really need to submit to this? Why does that even matter? Too many Christians ask these questions. They too, like Adam and Eve, negotiate. Oh, did God really say? Oh, will I really be punished? Thankfully, Jesus did not negotiate. His example teaches us that true sons and daughters of God live by every word that God has spoken. Now, we cannot forget that by disobeying God, Adam and Eve made an evil choice. But here's a philosophical dilemma. I'm going to try and read it slowly. How can a creature... All right. How can a creature who has no sinful disposition, no sinful desire, no sinful inclination, how can that creature make a wicked choice? That's a philosophical question when it comes to the fall. How can Adam and Eve, who had no predisposition to sin, no inclination, how can they make a wicked choice? Now, to answer this question, some say there's a free will. The will is free. Well, to talk about a, a, a free will, it, it, that's not really enough. That doesn't really satisfy the answer. All right, so their will was free. Well, then where, where's, where did that disposition come from? It doesn't matter if their will was free or not. Where did that disposition, that disinclination come from? For, for a free will just simply means they were uncoerced. But that doesn't answer uh, how they sinned. Now, a coerced will, if they were forced to sin, would mean that they could not be held morally accountable. If God forced them to sin, it would, be, it would mean God is a sinner. It would mean God is this malicious puppeteer. And so we, we, we can't say it's that. We know it's not that. And so Genesis chapter 3 portrays a couple who were not coerced, but seduced. That's the, the key word, the key understanding here. They had the moral ability to refuse temptation. They were morally able to say to the serpent, 
No. They were perfectly able to do that. And this is attested to the fact that God held them accountable and responsible. If they weren't capable of saying no, then God could not and would not have punished them. But instead of refusing temptation, instead of saying no, they succumbed to temptation. They were seduced by the temptation. They were morally, consciously, voluntarily deciding to do evil. Now, if they chose according to this desire, which was an evil action, all right, choosing to disobey God is an evil action. Where and when did, that, did they first have that evil desire? Where did that come from? That's the question that, that, that we wrestle with. And unfortunately, the Bible actually never tells us where it comes from. We don't know what motivated them. But we do know that their desire was twisted into a bad result. Perhaps they did think that the devil was truly on their side. Perhaps they did think that he was telling the truth. But what they meant for good, what they thought was good, was actually evil. Now, to better answer this question, we can actually look once again to Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. For example, in that, he was tempted by Satan with food. All right, remember, remember why Jesus is in the wilderness. All right, he was de you know, baptized, declared the beloved son of God. Jesus goes into the wilderness and fasts for 40 days. Okay, that's why we do Lent. He fasts for 40 days and he was hungry. Okay, I've never fasted for that long, but when I do fast, I know I'm hungry. Okay, I'm starving. And so nothing is inherently sinful about hunger. There is nothing inherently sinful about desiring food. If, if Jesus' tummy was growling in the wilderness, that's not sin. But if Jesus had acted on that desire and responded to Satan's temptation, remember what Satan said to Jesus? He said, turn these stones into bread. In other words, the devil saw Jesus. I'm paraphrasing here. Hey, Jesus, you've been out here for so long. You must be hungry. You must be starving. You're famished. There's, there's nothing out here. We're in the wilderness. How about you just turn that rock into bread? You know, if, if you are the son of God, you can do that. Maybe Jesus' tummy was growling even louder. But Jesus desired in that moment more to obey God than to satisfy his own needs. What was his response to Satan? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word of God, or by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That was Jesus' desire, was to obey his Father. And so disobedience is at the heart of every sin. All right, that's the end of, chapter, of Article 1. Any questions? Mm -hmm. But I would rather they use the word like is willing to permit. Mm -hmm. Well, but not please. Please sounds like you wanted it to happen. Oh, please do that. Well, and, and, and it is. I mean, that's, that's the difference. If to say that God, what was your phrase? That what, what, is it, what do you desire it to say? Willing. God, that God was willing to accept it to or to willing to allow it. See, when you think, think about that, if, if God is willing to allow something, who then is sovereign? Is it man or is it God? If God is willing to allow something to happen, meaning he is willing to step aside and let man make the decision, who is sovereign? It is man. And man can never be sovereign. That's why we started with chapter 2 talking about uh, the attributes of God. And, and one of those attributes is God's sovereignty. If God is perfectly sovereign, 
meaning he is in control over everything. When we think of sovereigns, we sometimes think of our modern day sovereigns, like the Queen of England. She's, a, she's considered a sovereign, but she doesn't do anything. She, she really has little power. The only thing, by and large, she can do is declare war and approve the government that's going to act in her name. She's, she's not really sovereign over anything in England. So we have a, a misunderstanding of when it comes to sovereign sovereignty, even if we think of our own monarchs in our day and age. God is perfectly sovereign, meaning that he is not only king sitting over this reign, this kingdom, he is actively involved and engaged. That's why we also had chapter 3 with the decree of God. Uh, chapter 3 talked about how God is involved in every single aspect of human of human activity, of the world. That's why we had chapter five with providence, talking, excuse me, talking about how God provides for the world, provides for his church, provides, God is actively involved. If God, at this very early stage, steps aside and lets man make the decision, then that brings into question every single act that God does in the Bible. Is God just stepping aside and letting it happen? Does God not have control then over, um, over the, the things that are going on? God has to have control. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. And if he makes the wrong choice, are you going to be pleased? Mm -hmm. Well, no, in, in a sense. Well, that's what I have a problem and that's, with. And, and it's because you're thinking of God in human terms, in human language. Yes, I, I as a father, would be displeased by my son's wrong choices. Every parent here is. And God is displeased when we sin. That is scriptural. That is in the Bible. What when, when the, the Westminster Divines use the word please, they are, they are what's, what's called covenantal list. That's, that's the theology that they are espousing. That's the theology that they're coming from. And, and the reason this is sort of going off, we're, we're going to talk about covenants, I think, in the next chapter. But I want to briefly just talk about this. So the covenantalists see three covenants, and I'm only going to talk about the first covenant. The first covenant is the covenant, covenant of redemption, okay? The covenant of redemption took place in eternity past, okay? It's, it's, uh, it, the actual covenant is not written in scripture, but if you turn to John, in the book of John, where Jesus says, um, my father has sent me, I come not of my own, but... Uh, of he who sent me, you know, Jesus talks about that, I think, in, is that John 6, John 10? Somewhere, I, I have to go back and read it. But Jesus talks about how the Father sent him, and that he comes uh, not of his own will. Of course, we can think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's praying, uh, take this cup from me. Let not, it's not my will be done, but your will. And so he's talking about this, this, this relationship that Jesus said, well, when did that, when did that, happened? When did that, dis when was that conversation had? Well, if Jesus as the second person of the Trinity is fully eternal, like the first person of the Trinity, the son and the father, they're co-eternal, then clearly that, that covenant, that contract, that desire happened in eternity past. So that's where we get the covenant of redemption. The covenant of redemption was always that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, would enter into this world, die on the cross, and redeem fallen human beings. Now, this happened long before the fall actually ever occurred, okay? If that decision was made in eternity past, if this covenant was built in eternity past, and that covenant was made before the foundations of the world were even laid. And so that means... If God is having this covenant in mind, it does please him that Adam and Eve would, would sin, would fall. 
because what that means is it's, it's setting up the activities, the, the plan of redemption. The plan of redemption, which is God's plan, plan A, remember there's no plan B, there's no plan C, plan A has always been this. And plan A, plan starts with the fall. Well, really it starts before that, but one of the, the, the markers of that is the fall. And so it pleased God that the plan is coming to fruition, that the plan is happening, that things are falling into place as he designed it. So that's why I think the, the, the Westminster Divines use that word, it pleased God. Um, that, that would be my answer, because I, I, I have a feeling they have this in mind when they are forming this document. So it's a good question. Um, and it's something that, you know, we have to wrestle with. I'm wondering if they wrestled with it. I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. You know, they took them, Steve, what if I said, they convened in 1643, and I think this document was ready by 1647. I mean, that's four years of, of debate and, and conversation. So I'm sure, I'm sure it came up and, and yeah. Um, all right, any other questions on Article 1? I'm just going to look and see what this reference to Romans 11 says. Romans 11:32. 11, Sorry, I was just looking. So here, I'm just looking here. So the, the Westminster Divines put that footnote B there, and it references to Romans 11:32. Romans 11.32 says, For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. I'm not sure that really answers the question. But it does show that, that it's part of his design. You know. All right, Article 2. Article 2 is about the result of sin. All right, that's a short one, so we can get through that. All right, Article 2 says... By this sin, excuse me, by this sin, they fell from their original righteousness and communion with God, and so became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the parts and faculties of soul and body. So this is the result of sin. So when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, they probably thought that the serpent was right. Remember his words, you surely will not die. And when they ate it, indeed, they did not immediately die. And so, in a way, the serpent's lie, the serpent's prediction came true. They didn't immediately die. And verse 7 there actually says, Indeed, the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. So instead of falling flat dead, they, their eyes were opened, and they saw the way that God sees so rather than immediate death, they're innocent. And, and I think I've defined the word innocent before. I know I've defined it in a sermon, but I want to define it here again. When I say innocent, and when the scriptures talk about innocent, the, the Greek and the Hebrew word means something that is pure, something that is unmixed. So when something is innocent in the Bible, especially when we're talking about theology, we're talking about faith, uh, they... they in their innocent, pure, and unmixed knowledge of God. So they had a perfect understanding of God. Now, it wasn't full and complete, but they understood God perfectly because they were in perfect communion with him. Now, in that moment, when they ate of the tree, the forbidden fruit, when their eyes were open, their knowledge of God became corrupted. It became mixed with sin and shame and guilt. So it was no longer innocent because it was no longer pure. It became impure. And so the shame at their nakedness and their fear of the presence of God, these were outward tells, outward signs of that inward unrighteousness, of that inward planting of sin. 
So when they ate of the forbidden fruit, they disobeyed God. And when they disobeyed God, they ate this fruit, and they saw, as God sees, they saw the unrighteousness that they just consumed, or that, that was birthed and twisted into them. And so the curse of death for their unrighteousness is realized. Immediately, they became spiritually dead. But they also, in verse 19, God curses them with death till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now here's the thing. This is actually... When we think about this story and this scene and this episode of the fall, we often think, oh man, that's terrible. That sucks. Oh, God's overreacting. Why is he, what is he, what's going on here? We fail when we, when we think that way. We actually fail to see that there's some good news going on in here. Instead of immediately dying, which God in the first covenant with Adam and Eve you shall not eat of the tree of the farm, blah, 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 or you will surely die. God, as the author of that covenant, had every single right and authority to strike Adam and Eve dead in that moment. As soon as their lips touched that fruit, God had every right to destroy them. But he didn't. And this is the good news. He didn't because of his grace. And his mercy. So when people say, oh, you, there, where's grace in the Old Testament? Chapter 3 of Genesis, you see grace. God delayed death. They still received death because death is the punishment for their sin. They, we all die as a result of this. Death entered into this world because of that disobedience. Paul says as much. Hebrews says as much. But God's grace is shown, is made evident, because by delaying their physical death, God is allowing them to live out and live the life of the covenant of grace and to receive the forgiveness of their sins. And so they will experience pain, suffering, and death as a sign of God's judgment, but they will also get to experience the forgiveness and the grace of God. So nevertheless, they, they did immediately become dead in their sin. So their, their physical death may have been delayed, but their spiritual death was immediate. Now, spiritual death, as I define it, as the framers of the uh, confession define it, is the total corruption of sin. And so here, and so they became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the parts and faculties of soul and body. So that's how they define dead in sin. This is the long way of saying, oh, I shouldn't use this blue marker. Goodness. <laughs> Um, that's the, the long way of talking about the Reformed doctrine of total depravity. I know you all have heard total depravity before, right? I've mentioned it. Um, I don't really like the phrase total depravity when we're talking about this. I, I prefer um, total inability. And I'm going to explain why. Usually when we, when we think of the word depravity or something is depraved, we think that there is not a single ounce of anything good that can come of that. If something is totally depraved, if, if someone's depraved, we say that that person is, 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 there's nothing good in him. That person is absolutely, completely corrupt and morally bad, and, and, and we just need to get away from him. So that's when, when we think of the word depravity, that's, that's what comes to, to our mind. And so I just change it just for 
um, syntax uh, is, is total inability here. Um, what this means, and when, they, when we talk about total depravity in general, and just so everyone knows, we know what, you know what we're talking about here, the five points of Calvinism, tulip. The first one is total depravity. And so when we talk about total depravity or total inability, or when, when the framers say they are dead in their sin, they're wholly defiled in all their parts, what they're saying is the spiritually dead, the person who is spiritually dead, like someone who is physically dead, is completely incapable of bringing about eternal life. So the person who is spiritually dead is completely unable, incapable of bringing about eternal life in themselves. And that makes sense if you think of it logically. Someone who is dead, a dead person, cannot raise themselves. We know that. We see that happening in the scriptures. Whenever there are bodily resurrections, are the dead people raising themselves? No. It's someone else acting and raising them. So dead people can't raise themselves into life, can't resurrect themselves. So the spiritually dead cannot and are incapable of bringing about eternal salvation. The spiritually dead are, are completely corrupt in this sense. And so that's where we get the word depravity, is it relates to the corruption, the total corruption in the sense that every single aspect has been touched by sin. You know, where the, the spiritually dead are not zombies. You ever see, you know, the zombie movies, zombie stories where they're dead, but they're not dead or they're undead. You know, they're part alive, part dead. That's not what the spiritually dead are. They're not zombies. They are fully dead. The spiritually dead are completely dead in their spirit. And so every aspect of the spiritually dead has been defiled. And so that's where the total part comes in. And the total means every single aspect of the human race, all parts, all faculties, as the divines say, the whole soul, the whole body has been defiled by sin. And what this means is we cannot think, we cannot conjure, we cannot suggest, we cannot assume anything righteous within or by ourselves. The only way is through an outside force. Now, and I'm talking specifically about things that are righteous. I'm talking in the spiritual world right now. Things that are right and pleasing and obedient to God. The spiritually dead person cannot obey God. The spiritually dead person cannot perform acts of righteousness that are pleasing to God. The spiritually dead is totally corrupt and defiled when in the presence of God. Now that's, and I mentioned this in one of my sermons recently, that runs counterintuitive to our experience sometimes. We look out in the world and we can see people who, all right, we know that that person's not a Christian. We know that that person doesn't believe in God. And yet that person is out there you know, giving money to the poor, is out there uh, serving in a soup kitchen. In fact, many non-believers, many atheists, many, many other you know, non-Christians put Christians to shame in their good works, in their good deeds. But what that is, as I mentioned that sermon, Calvin calls that civic virtue. And it is an aspect of the common grace that God gives to every single human being. That God lets the rain fall on a just and unjust, that's common grace. That people can obey the laws and follow the rules, that's common grace. That people can show compassion and forgiveness, 
and kindness to others, that's common grace. But what we're talking about when it comes to spiritual deadness, it doesn't matter how many acts of goodness you do. It doesn't matter how many soup kitchens you serve. It doesn't matter how much you give to charity. If you are spiritually dead, those things are worthless to God. The only way and the only time that those things count, the only time that God looks upon those things and smiles is if you are born again. If you are a regenerated Christian, if you are born of the Spirit, as Jesus says in John 3, if you are still in the flesh, if you are an unregenerate believer, if you're un so you can't even be an unregenerate believer, if you're an unregenerate person, then you're Acts of kindness and goodness are just acts of civic virtue. And congratulations, you're being kind and you're following the rules, but you're not earning heaven. You're not guaranteed entrance into heaven. And so that's what spiritual deadness is. And so we cannot think, conjure, suggest, or assume anything righteous within or by our Selves. And so what that means is we need an outside force to help us make our decisions. And that's true generally. That's certainly true when it comes to righteousness. It takes God having to step in into our hearts, into our minds, the Holy Spirit entering into the regenerated person and bending the will to, to God. Where the Holy Spirit is absent, where there is indeed instead a, a spirit of lawlessness, what is it that pushes the person? What is, what's the force that leads people? It's sin and unrighteousness and evil. Now, we're going to unpack more of this a little bit later, so I'm just going to stop here um, and we'll, we'll talk more about this particular article later on when we get into the confession. And we're at time, so I'll just go ahead and stop here, too, and we'll pick up with Article 3 um, next week. So any questions so far? So a lot to unpack when we get to, when we start talking about the fall. Also, the, the, the Westminster Vines put so much fall of man and sin and the punishment all in the one, one article or one chapter. All right? Well, if there are any other questions, we'll close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we're sad and, and, and we're hurt and we're offended that there is so much brokenness in this world. Indeed, many of us have been affected directly by the broken and the sins and the corruption of, of our race. And Lord, we look upon this world and we, we see a world that is in need, a world that is hurting. And we want to change it. We want to things to get better. But alas, we realize that we don't have that power. Lord, if there's anything that the fall teaches us, it's that only you and you alone can bring about true and everlasting peace. As we await that day, we strive and we, we yearn to teach people and proclaim the good news that you have written down for us, the good news of redemption, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. And so as we await that perfect peace, may we continue to proclaim and teach and share that good news. And until that day, give us your strength and give us your perseverance. It is in Jesus' name that we pray.